It is an honor to have you here with us. Shakespeare expert, teacher, classical and opera director. How did your passion for Shakespeare start? Uh, it's tricky because when I was in college, I had a class which I liked very, very much. It was at Carleton College in Minnesota. And we read a play a week for a whole year, for three semesters, three terms. It was a trimester system. And uh, each week we had to do a paper on that play. And so it was pretty it was pretty intensive because there was no way to get around it. And the teacher, whose name was George Soule, loved acting out all the roles. So it was most it was very entertaining in class when he would start playing all the things. And it really I think that's the class that really triggered really triggered interest. I grew up in the Northeast in New York, basically, and traveled <clears throat> with my parents very often to go to see shows, and they liked Shakespeare very much. So we went to see stuff like, I mean, I can re vaguely remember seeing like Morris Karnofsky doing King Lear and things like that, and then Cyril Richard in, uh, I think Cyril Richard was in Midsummer Night's Dream or something, but, and Catherine Hepburn was in A Twelfth Night. So there were all those sort of things, but it was really the college stuff that made me most interested. You are a teacher at schools like Juilliard and Circle in the Square Theater School. When did you decide it was important for you to teach classical text? I, I don't know that I decided that. I think it was decided for me because I'd been invited to direct, not Shakespeare, but to direct plays up at Williamstown Theater Festival. And Nico Sakharopoulos, who was the founder of that company and was running it at that time, was also teaching at Circle. And so he said, you know, you should come down to Circle and teach there. And so at first at Circle, I was teaching, actually was directing projects and then did a few classes because there was a very, very wonderful um, classical text teacher there named Marge Phillips. And um, when she stopped teaching, they asked if I would take over the classes. And then I started doing more and more of it. And at the same time, it's, sort of, it's weird, but I was invited by some different schools, including Williams, where Williamstown Theater Festival is, to do projects there, which started to broaden my relationship to teaching in general, I guess. Do you think it is essential for an actor to know how to work a classical text? I, you know, I, of course I do. I mean, it's, you know, I have no job. I don't have a, I won't have a salary if they don't do it. I mean, I think that, uh, I think what happens when you have to work on a difficult text, and whether it's Shakespeare or Greek or another classical, Lorca, any, any of the classic texts demand more of you than most contemporary writing does in terms of your understanding of the text and the way you use the language. So the deeper you get into text work in more complex plays, then when you look at a contemporary script or a, a, a less written out script where more is in subtext and less is in text, I think you have a better way of approaching the language itself and approaching the play dramatically, dramaturgically. So I think studying classical text is, is actually quite important in finding, finding oneself as an actor. I mean, there's so much material now where people are more models than actors, and that's a very different style. And I'm not sure, we still call it acting because it's acting, but it's more about modeling and knowing how to, how to make what one is thinking visible on camera, um, very often without text. So that's a very, it's a very different skill set. What makes Shakespeare great? <laughs> That's unanswerable. Uh, I don't know. I really don't. I think it's the, the humanity of it. I think it's the complexity. Most of the characters, especially from the middle plays on, the characters are so ambiguous. And so they can be interpreted in many, many different ways. 
And I think that's part of what makes Shakespeare so wonderful is that it's, it's approachable, the basic stories and basic characters are there all the time. But the, the ability to reinterpret Shakespeare and still have a sense of humanity is pretty amazing. I also think that thematically, because Shakespeare deals with so many issues that have remained important in the world, that there's a kind of universality to the writing that's unusual. It's why some of the Greek plays are still done so frequently. And frankly, why so many plays that are more only attentive to their own period uh, tend to disappear. What is a common mistake that actors make when they work on Shakespeare? I think actors think Shakespeare is hard, and I think that's a mistake because one of the things that Shakespeare did was to write for actors. An idea that I love in Shakespeare is that when Shakespeare's on its feet, it makes more sense than when you sit around and read it. And I think that's a big thing in doing Shakespeare, is that people get into Shakespeare as if it's only a literary or only an academic idea. But in fact, Shakespeare, when you're doing it on its feet in a scene, playing an action, you have an objective intention or any of that you know, stuff, somehow the, Shakespeare, the language makes sense because Shakespeare wrote for actors. He wasn't writing for academics. And I think something that's happened is that a lot of Shakespeare, and I get caught in this frequently, is, is taught more as an academic study than as an actor study. And I think when, I, I mean, I think most actors, when they get into a Shakespeare play, they realize that it makes more sense than they thought it did when they tried to make sense of it sitting down. When you stand up, it makes sense. If you just sit there, it's like, oh, what could that possibly mean? And somehow you start doing something, and all of a sudden it makes sense. And that's, that's where I think a big mistake is. The other thing is that I think, and I, so this is sort of a book I've wanted to write that I've never written, which is moving Shakespeare from the page into action. That in fact choosing, finding intentions for characters or objectives for characters is very critical in making sense of Shakespeare. And I think that a lot of actors get stuck simply playing the language instead of playing the intention. What do I want? And somehow then the language will serve it. If you've come up with good intentions, the language itself will serve what you want. But if you're not playing an intention, then all you can play is the language. And I think that's sort of boring. I mean, the language is good, but... Music seems to be very important for you. You have also directed musicals and operas. How do you approach an opera, and what type of directing do you prefer? <laughs> I don't know if I can answer which I prefer. So I love music, and I love the fact that Shakespeare uses so much music. A lot of plays do, not just Shakespeare. Um, for me, big difference is that the composer is a major interpreter of text. If you approach the text of an opera as if it exists without the music, then you're cutting off one of the major tools of interpretation of the opera. So, in understanding what the opera is about, you have to somehow intuit what the music is saying as an interpretation of what the text is saying. And then re and realizing that the composer has given you a very strong statement of what he or she believes the opera, the story is and what it means. And so I think that that's, that's something that I like about opera because you have input not just from uh, the, the librettist or from the, the script writer, but also from the composer who says, no, this is what it's about and the musical phrase means so much. One of the other things about Shakespeare that, that I love, and that is separate from a lot of writers, is that he's never so sacred as not to be willing to make a joke of some kind in the midst of something that could be incredibly serious. And I think that one of the great things in Shakespeare is when you start to dig out that sense of humor, you start to find in the midst of what could be profoundly serious ideas and moments, emotional moments, that in fact there's an incredible sense of humor that's still operating. And it can be very raunchy, it can be very serious humor, it can be witty, it can be, you know, wordplay, but somehow it shows up all over the place in Shakespeare. And I think that's something else in teaching that I like, is to try to encourage actors to look at 
where like I'm playing a serious scene and suddenly there's something that seems sort of offbeat. And well, it may be that the character, as we all do in life, suddenly has a sense of a, a strange sense of humor or, or irony that lets humor in that we don't expect. And I think that's one of the things in the way Shakespeare writes that sort of keeps us off our guard. Too many plays, productions of Shakespeare seem to me to stay like we're doing a serious play now. And so there's, they, people don't let the humor into it. Aspen is a destination that you cannot miss each year. Tell us a little bit about your work there. I've been running the program in Aspen for about 30 years which is much too long, and I, sh I can't believe they've let me do it for this long. Um, I started out there directing, and then was promoted into being in charge of the opera program. What we do is audition singers from all over the U.S., and also now by video from the world, um, and bring 60 to 70 singers to Aspen each summer. The singers participate in three fully staged productions, plus weekly scenes master classes, uh, which have become sort of big public events. And for people who are only in straight theater, it's a weird situation to imagine because people get up to perform like a scene from an opera. After they've done it, this is with piano mostly, sometimes we do them with orchestra also. After they perform the scene, I'll be on stage with them. And essentially as a director, give them somewhat different approaches to what they're doing, mostly aimed at getting them to be more like human beings and less stiff in the way they look at singing and performing. And then we repeat large sections of the scenes. And one thing over the years that's been, I think, wonderful is that singers really have a chance to find a level of relaxation in their work in front of an audience. The scenes classes, as are the productions, are performed in the Wheeler Opera House, which is about a 500-seat 1880s opera house um, that's very flattering for the singer. And, and we're, the scenes programs, as are the operas, are, are usually very full. So there's a real sense of community with the audience. And it's the give and take with the audience that I think teaches the singers more than anything. I mean, they don't learn vocal technique. They don't learn literal acting techniques, but I try to encourage them in terms of what they're doing as a performer to really communicate something with what they, what they want to say with, with, and how they're doing it. The other part of Aspen that's important is that it's of course in the mountains, and uh, so you're at 8,000 feet, which means there's very little oxygen, and people have to sing and run around, and people wind up, I think, getting a very healthy sense of living in a natural environment and being inspired, I mean literally inspired by trees and mountains, rivers, not that much river, but um, uh, bears, a lot of bears, and you get inspired by these things and they sort, of, they sort of make you look at the world differently. It's different than working in Manhattan and I think that's been very healthy. I think it's, I, I mean I'd love it going out there. So. You are constantly trying to create new ways of directing Shakespeare. For example, Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream with Mendelssohn's score with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. How did that happen? And do you have more projects like that? Well, I, I, you know, I look at these things. I mean, I first, the Mendelssohn thing was, of course, because Mendelssohn himself wrote, wrote that music as incidental music. And uh, people have worked on this for many years of sort of how to do it. And, Initially, before Baltimore, I was invited by the New York Philharmonic to come up with a new script for how to approach it, and which I did, and which was went well. And then, and then, uh, wound up doing it in Baltimore. And then, it's been the script itself has been produced elsewhere, um, which is good. It's it's cool, and I think it's a good. I think the marriage of classical music with classical text can be very very exciting. And then also has been depending on the budget. Uh, what can be done physically and visually in any given production is, is pretty amazing because of being able to do, whether it's lighting or costumes or scenic effect of some kind, and, and then, you know, being able to expand on that. 
I, I look at these things. I, I've also done, of course, the Beatrice and Benedict, the Berlioz opera. I've done that in semi-staging, which was done. I decided this was also an originated with uh, Lyric Phil, and then I've done it elsewhere. Is the notion of having two separate casts because the ca the singing cast separated from the speaking cast meant that I could have very excellent people in both and then developed a relationship between the spoken Benedict and Beatrice and the sung Benedict and Beatrice. And so when they would pass off the characters, the sense of the way that people change within the storytelling of the play was communicated also in the style of the production. So that was, that was fun, you know. And there are more that I'd like to do this way, so. What do you think of Shakespeare on a big screen? Do you think it's a language that works on camera? It's some films are great and some aren't. I mean, you know, it's the quality is so varied. I loved when people were bold enough to do, what was that, She's the Man, was that the title? Which was the, the Twelfth Night version that was a complete up, or O, oh, where it was a complete updating of Othello. And I like when people, it's like why I liked, um, what was that, Clueless, which was the updating of Jane Austen's Emma. Um, and I thought that Clueless was an incredibly wonderful adaptation of Jane Austen. And it, of course, had nothing literal to do with it, I mean, but inspired by. And I think with Shakespeare, I think the films that try to do it as if it's a play get in trouble, usually. And if they try to be too faithful to the play, in a sense, by not letting the film speak, they get in trouble. I think that when the films of Shakespeare uh, really, really use the values of film to tell the story, and frankly cut the plays because the visual is telling so much story, that it winds up, they wind up being pretty wonderful. That's why I like the, Pete, I think it's the Peter Brook uh, Lear that I thought was extremely successful as a film. And where they didn't really do that much of the text, I mean, they cut a fair amount. Whereas other other versions, uh, not just of Lear, but of Myths Are Nice Dreams specifically, seems to get done a lot, where they, they try to keep too much text when the visual storytelling really takes care of a lot of it. It seems one of your main goals is to bring the words of Shakespeare to the people. But why do you think nowadays it's harder to get young kids to see a Shakespeare play? Or do you think it is? Shakespeare. <laughs> I mean, I, I, something that's curious to me is that, is that when you announce, I mean, there aren't that many Shakespeare plays that parents bring their children to. But when Shakespeare plays are announced, it seems as if it's almost easier to get kids to go to see the Shakespeare than to go to see Chekhov. Or who's another great playwright? I mean, like, David Mamet. I mean, you think of who, well, who are the, or Arthur Miller. I mean, it, seem, it seems as though Shakespeare's university, universality still speaks very well to, to people. And so going to see Shakespeare is, can usually be pretty popular. I mean, people talk about that, and I certainly believe that somewhere in the world, Midsummer Night's Dream is being produced every day, and probably in every language of the world. And there are still audiences flocking to see it. So I, I, I don't think Shakespeare as a form is dying. I think that theater as a form is, is having trouble more than Shakespeare is. I ask you this because it's been constantly repeated. Shakespeare is not for everyone. You do not agree with this statement. I, you know, of course it's not for everyone. I mean, nothing is for everyone. But I think that the, the ideas within Shakespeare as a, as a writer and as a storyteller, think of, him, think of him as a storyteller first. I think that there's elements in his plays that really are for many, many people. It's why culturally, it's like, who's the, the who, who directed Ron? It was Kurosawa, I guess. I mean, and the idea that, that in a Japanese culture could, could take Lear into a fantastic film and somehow it would be the story of that. I, I love the quote that was from a Vietnamese director, I don't remember who it was, who said that, of course, the story of Midsummer Night's Dream is based on ancient Vietnamese legend because the director saw the play so strongly as a, as a vision of the mixing of the human and fairy 
and common working people mixing together all in search of love, and that this was obviously based on ancient Vietnamese legends, and refused to discuss it except as being clearly Shakespeare somewhere had heard about this ancient tale. And I think that's the thing about as a storyteller with Shakespeare that I think that is very appealing to many, many cultures and many, many people. So, I don't know if that's an answer. <laughs> the, is... the Vietnamese thing is true, and it's very interesting to read that article. It's a very interesting article. Because she was, I think she is, was committed to how important it was that this truly was a Vietnamese story. And, this, and it had to be. It, just, it had to be. If you had all the resources of the world, what play would you like to direct? Where would you direct it? And who would be your main actor, actress, dead or alive? Also, also unanswerable. Yeah. I mean, truly unanswerable. Because there's no single play. I mean, there are a lot of plays that I really like, so it's, it's really impossible to narrow it down to any, any one play. Or, or actor, I think. I mean, I think... I mean, I think, you know, the actor who most affected me sitting in a theater live was probably Jason Robards Jr. And it was in a production of Moon for the Misbegotten directed by Jose Quintero. It was done on Broadway and with Colleen Dewhurst. And what was extraordinary in it was that in a moment in the second half of the evening where the character, where Jamie is breaking down, the first time I saw it, I was convinced, truly convinced, that he could never get to the end of the play because as an actor, he had so exposed his own vulnerabilities. And somehow, with Colleen's help, he did. So I went back to see it again. And I'll be damned, it had the same effect. And then I realized that what was amazing was that his, his personal craft and talent as an actor went so deep that he could drive right to that place where an audience could feel the level of shame that he was feeling and still be able to be rescued from it. And I thought, well, that's really good acting because I actually, I truly believed, and I believed the second and then the third time, I truly believed the experience that he was going through, the character was going through. And then I thought, well, that's what, that's the model as far as I'm concerned, that was that's truly the model of what, in terms of what I've seen, and that he did, and what she did when when Colleen Dewhurst held held him uh, on her lap to comfort him was amazing. I mean, really amazing. And that was also, I mean, what she did was was as well. But it was really his getting to that place of such extraordinary vulnerability. That, uh, that was really, that was pretty shattering. So I think if I had to choose one actor, that would be pretty close. Do you have a favorite Shakespeare quote, a line? A line? Well, I was, I, I, you know, sometimes I go to what's past his prologue, the Tempest line that Antonio says, which I've always liked because what's past his prologue, what to come in yours and my discharge, which I think is correct. And I've always liked it because it, it sounds like it's, okay, the past is the past, now let's make the future, which many people use as a very positive idea. But of course, Antonio is a cynic. And so that actually Antonio is being very cynical about what he's planning to do in the future, which has to do with killing his brother or things like that. But, um, but I've always liked it as a quote because it has that double edge that Shakespeare has, which is you hear it, especially out of context, and you think, oh, this is a really hopeful moment. And then you turn it around and realize that it's what he's promising is, is not hopeful. That's why it's like the kill and smile. You know, it's like what's the best, the great villains, the comments about, you know, the great villains is that they can look at you and smile and then kill you. And Shakespeare's full of those, too. Thank you so much, Ed, for being here with us. Here at Beat 10, and from all your students, mentees, and colleagues all over the world, we thank you for your never-ending passion and incredible knowledge. And this is a personal thought, but when we were working together in Romeo and Juliet in Baltimore, and I was struggling with the last monologue, 
We sat together at this cafe and we went line by line and it all made sense in every single way. So thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs>